thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you all, um, and I hope it's been a, a fruitful week so far. Um, yeah, uh, as um, as the introduction has has said, um, I'm joining you from the east of England on a, on a typically grey, uh, rainy summer's day. Um, but I'm going to be speaking about uh, a very different part of the world, um, sub-equatorial Africa, particularly Southeast Africa and uh, West Central Africa. Um, and this is really work that I have been carrying out during my PhD, but um, quite a lot of it has, has taken place um, after uh, and in, in the sort of last few years when I've managed to get back into um, my earlier research after my postdoc. Uh, to try to situate myself in any single discipline is, is difficult. I'm a geographer first and foremost, but um, I work predominantly within the sub-disciplines of environmental history, uh, historical climatology, um, which I believe you'll have had some uh, discussion around earlier in the week. Um, and I'm, while I'm based at Lincoln, I also have a uh, research fellowship at the University of the Free State, um, where I work with um, a group of African historians from all across the subcontinent. What I want to do in this talk um, is focus on three questions and three areas. And I'll try to keep to these during the talk and I'll come back to them at the end. Uh, firstly, I want to question, well, was there a little ice age in, in Africa and, and what did that look like? Um, you're going to see a few wiggly lines here. Uh, I guess you'll have seen quite a few already in the week, but um, they, they won't take up the majority of the talk. Um, secondly, I want to look at the question of how was the Little Ice Age experienced and perceived? That analysis will largely take place through the lens of uh, colonial records, um, which has its own problems. Um, and uh, that's something that I'll be, I'll be touching on during that part of the talk. Um, as, as is shown in the right-hand image, um, Southeast Africa and West Central Africa came under European, uh, particularly Portu Portuguese colonization from the late 15th and early 16th century. We have continuous written records um, throughout uh, those, uh, the following centuries, which, which does enable um, analysis of of this period of the, the late Little Ice Age, though of course that comes with its, with its own problems and pitfalls. Thirdly, I want to look at this question of how people responded to climate variability within the Little Ice Age. And really going beyond the, the um, colonial context here, I want to look at a, a comparative case study of um, how, um, how uh, colonial settlements and um, uh, indigenous communities responded to um, multi-year droughts in particular, which I'll, I'll, I'll come on to the connection between those droughts and the Little Ice Age um, as we go through. I'm happy to take questions uh, or discussion points during as well as after the presentation. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on that, but if, if you'd like to uh, raise your hand or ask anything during the talk, I'm more than happy to um, be interrupted. So just to start with this first question, which um, I'll only dwell on for a couple of slides, um, of what was there a little ice age in Africa and what did it look like? What we see here and uh, what I guess you'll have had some introduction to in the earlier part of the week are um, a range of, of natural archives um, uh, or paleoclimate records. Um, in, in Africa as a whole, we have considerably less of those records than we do in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, but also different areas of the Southern Hemisphere like uh, South America and Australasia, um, where uh, the environments um, in, in some parts of those um, continents and subcontinents are more favorable for the production of tree rings, for example. Um, that said, particularly in recent years, we do have an increasing number of these records, particularly from uh, cave stalagmites um, and lake sediments and uh, other um, geological and dendrochronological archives. Um, 
what the, the right hand graph shows, and I've put a red line down it to sort of illustrate um, the variability in the period that we're talking about as um, an imprint of the Little Ice Age in, in uh, sub-equatorial Africa, um, aligned with that top graph, which shows Northern hemisphere temperatures, is that there was a um, temperature imprint of cooling in uh, sub-equatorial Africa. And that imprint uh, was particularly strong uh, in the late 17th and early 18th century, which we might uh, call the peak of the Little Ice Age in Southern Africa. In terms of the historical record, we don't really have a great deal uh, to match up to those records in terms of temperature. Um, there are sporadic references to snow, like this quote uh, you see here um, refers to, um, though, they though they lie between the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn, the snow on these mountains is so abundant that anyone remaining on the heights during the winter season uh, is uh, frozen to death. Um, but those, those comments are the exception rather than the rule in, in the historical record. Okay, so we, we don't really have much source of corroboration of those natural archives, at least insofar as temperature is concerned. Does anybody know why we might not have much information on, on temperature from historical observers in this part of the world? So other than oral history being more common, um, yeah, so uh, all historical records are also an important um, source of information and they, they often capture better, at least um, the voices of indigenous populations rather than these external observers. But one important uh, uh, thing to note here is, is the comparison uh, of what actually matters to societies in, in this part of the world, which kind of climatic variable matters. And rather than temperature, it, it's really rainfall variability that um, is um, the, the, the primary um, determining factor in terms of um, threats and opportunities for agriculture, for pastoralism, um, and many other forms of livelihoods. A degree of temperature uh, may make a difference and may in turn influence that uh, rainfall variability, as, as we will see, but actually it's, it's the, the manifestation of that rainfall variability and moisture that, that really um, is, is, is most significant for human livelihoods. Can what I you see on the left a, here, oh. sorry. I just, can I pause and ask a clarifying question there? Yes. Which course. is when you say that temperature wouldn't have been the thing that was most important to them, are you suggesting that it may have been cooler, but it wouldn't have been enough cooler to really influence a whole lot about people's lives? And so they're not commenting on that. What matters is the rainfall. The thing that's going to cause them to have a different response is the rainfall. Yes. So in the regions that um, I'm talking about, um, it, it would have been rainfall that's the, that's the primary um, uh, immediate determinant of, um, of agricultural um, yields and, and so on and so forth. In the southwest of this region um, and the Cape, that, that may have been different. Um, and in parts of the, uh, the um, Drakensberg Mountains, just to the, the where, where you see the KK on the map near there. Um, those, those regions um, may have been more exposed to, to temperature variation, but, but in, um, in, in parts of the subtropics and um, further north into the tropics, it was uh, rainfall, which is, which is of course related, well, as I'll, as I'll go on to say, um, related to um, changes in temperature. It, it's really this manifestation of, of um, moisture vari variability that, that affects human societies. And that manifests geographically. So what you see on this map is a map of uh, aridity, um, the green and the blue being more uh, um, less arid and the brown and the yellow being, being more arid. And you see quite steep gradients in, in parts of these uh, regions. So in uh, West Central Africa, maybe if I can just use my pen, 
Um, so here, just in land, you see a very steep gradient of aridity um, in, in terms of uh, moisture. You're looking at a, a gradient of um, uh, several hundred, almost a thousand millimeters in, in a few hundred miles. And you have you have similar gradients uh, here in, in the southeast of the region. So geographically, there are steep moisture gradients, but also temporally between seasons and between decades, there are also very significant changes in, in rainfall availability and rainfall variability. And uh, much of the much of the region um, we're talking about here receives its rainfall in summer. And what this map also shows is the available sites that we have for past records of uh, rainfall from natural archives. Those uh, that you see sort of down here and that you see in, in the legend on this map here and also in the west of the region, you see uh, we have some records from uh, cave speleotherms and tree rings and lake sediments and so on. And these are what's the, uh, the, the outcomes of those uh, reconstructions from those natural archives look like. Um, on the left is West Central Africa, on the uh, right is Southeast Africa. Um, all the axes have been uh, adjusted so that um, the, the, the peaks show wetter periods and the troughs show drier periods. And actually what we see um, is that in West Central Africa, we have a, uh, a wetter period that, that matches up with that um, cooler period that I was talking about in the previous slide um, during that sort of peak little ice age um, uh, period. Whereas in the southeast of the, the region, we see uh, the opposite pattern. We see wet periods either side of that and a dry period during the little ice age. So whilst we might have a, a more consistent cooling in that uh, across much of Africa, and across uh, large parts of the world, actually how these periods manifested in terms of rainfall variability were, were rather different. And that's related to um, all kinds of relationships like uh, sea surface temperatures, the position of the westerlies, um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and many other factors and how they interact. Um, so I've just seen a question that, um, that has asked which, uh, what, what are some of the crops that are so moisture dependent? Well, um, sorghum is one of the more drought resistant crops, um, which was cultivated across large parts of the region. Millet is slightly more um, moisture dependent, uh, moisture sensitive rather, uh, but maize, um, which was introduced uh, by the Portuguese in the 16th, 17th centuries, is uh, significantly more um, vulnerable to moisture deprivation than sorghum and millet. And that's something that I'll perhaps come back to later. So really the message from, from this um, uh, slide is that we had a cooling, but actually rainfall is, is, is the most important variable that um, affected human livelihoods. And the rainfall patterns of the Little Ice Age profoundly differed between uh, different regions. So to move on to the second uh, talking point is, uh, which is how was the Little Ice Age experienced and perceived? Um, I want to actually go a little further back and uh, back in time and uh, bring that into the picture as well. Because this is where we have um, in, the, in the historiography, particularly in the archeological literature, um, but also in the paleoclimate literature, is we have a number of uh, kind of grand narratives about the rise and fall of African state structures. Um, most notably and probably most uh, internationally famous is uh, Great Zimbabwe, uh, which you see in this um, picture just here. Um, but also um, as equally as significantly as the state centered at uh, Mapungubwe Hill, which is shown here in uh, Northern South Africa, which um, is, is widely attributed to be Southern Africa's first state. So the processes that, uh, and the timing of those processes that, that led to the rise of those states and their abandonment of their capitals has been very much linked to and periodized within climatic conditions, partly because of the, the semi-arid setting of some of these states, 
and their dependence on uh, floodplain agriculture as well. But actually, um, what most of this work rests on is, is this coincidence between, uh, of timing between uh, processes of expa uh, expansion, territorial expansion, uh, monumental architectural construction, um, increased populations, uh, development of complex societies, is really based on this coincidence, as you see here in the bottom, in the bottom right, almost kind of plotting on uh, societal events and, and processes on, on a graph of uh, reconstructed temperature and rainfall changes, which is uh, problematic. And um, it, this kind of approach has come into in, in for much uh, criticism in uh, the Southern African case and beyond. So, the reasons for this um, are quite clearly because they, uh, the, these kind of hypotheses, they downplay uh, complex processes um, and they reduce them to, to changes in climate. Um, and in many cases, they, they, one of the ironies perhaps is that they um, ignore the, the very complexity that uh, these complex societies are, are said to uh, exhibit and, and rest upon. What I mean by that are things like uh, grain storage, as you see in this picture here, um, which was often centralized in, in, um, in, in African state structures. Um, they ignore things like uh, uh, resource control and uh, cultural worldviews, um, how changes in, in, in rainfall availability are, are perceived, um, things like trade patterns, um, alternative livelihoods, um, and uh, other options for, for gaining food like hunting and gathering and all of these different kinds of processes that, that interplay with um, climatic changes. But actually, secondly, as well, um, there's, there's been a line of criticism that says that just because a settlement was abandoned or, or, or a capital was abandoned, that does not necessarily mean that there was some sort of collapse or, or decline. Actually, these processes may give rise to, to new state structures and to, 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 new, um, uh, to new areas of, of, of settlement, um, new livelihoods, new economic um, opportunities, and, and so on and so forth. In fact, one of the, the successor states to, to Mapungubwe was Great Zimbabwe itself, which also later declined and um, had successor states in turn. So, so really, this, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of problems with this kind of approach of looking for, for declines in, in rainfall, matching that up temporally with um, moments of change and making a kind of cause and effect um, relationship between those two variables. And probably Dagomar Degroot, who spoke earlier in the week, uh, has flagged up this important paper that, that he and colleagues have published uh, recently, which really takes a look at the this kind of narrative that has underlain a lot, a lot of the, the research around climate history, which is that focus on decline and collapse at the expense of uh, uh, resilience and uh, survival and transformation, if you like. Um, that relates to, to many things like methodologies, to lack of uh, collaboration, lack of awareness even of, of, of data sources and approaches. But it's still, it's still a very significant problem um, in the literature. And I think this is a very important intervention by uh, Dagomar and colleagues to, to, to get deeper into, into some of those issues that characterize the literature. So what can we do to, to, to move towards that more rigorous uh, understanding that, that Dagomar has advocated for? Well, one of the things that um, I did, I'm not an archaeologist, um, I, I uh, appreciate and, and make use of archaeological data, but, but um, I'm a historian and I uh, chose to look at the later historical period, which, so, which overlaps with the, the Little Ice Age, of course, in, um, in, in, in Southern Africa. And what you see here is that um, certain parts of the region, particularly um, uh, Mozambique, um, sorry, just get my pen out again. Uh, Mo whoops, uh, Mozambique, uh, parts of Angola, and of course the, the Cape, and various other parts of, of West uh, Western Africa itself, 
um, did come under uh, increasing colonial expansion. And one of the byproducts of, of that expansion uh, relating to uh, slave trade and mineral, mineral exploitation um, and so on and so forth was in fact the production of, of documentary records. And there have been various attempts to, to make use of these to, to reconstruct um, past patterns of, of rainfall, which was uh, much better recorded than, than temperature. Um, and to, to do this across the continent, and you see some of those attempts on the right here. Uh, non for Mozambique though, which is what I'm going to talk about um, in, in a few slides. Um, the rest of this talk will uh, continue to focus on the two regions that I've spoken about at, at, um, in passing so far, which um, shown in this panel on the left um, is West Central Africa, Angola, um, which was inhabited by, again, these um, African state structures like the, the Kingdom of Congo, um, Angola and, and Cassandra and so on, and Sonia, um, which came under increasing uh, um, expansion from, from the Portuguese, um, from the, the sort of colonial footholds of, of Luanda and uh, Benguela um, later into the 16th and 17th century. And on the uh, opposite side of the continent, um, Mozambique, which was settled um, by the Portuguese again um, in the early 16th century at uh, Sofala um, and at settlements like uh, the island of Mozambique um, and Quilamane. And they, uh, from those coastal bases, they, they expanded up Zambezi, um, which I'll be talking about uh, later. And um, the, the reason for the interest of um, uh, at least in the southeast of Africa, in um, in uh, ex in the colonial expansion here, was in fact the the gold um, and uh, the alleged silver mines of the interior, which were inhabited by the uh, the great African states like the Matapa state, um, known in the popular literature as the Monomatapa state, um, and other. Um, uh, African political structures um, like the uh, Tor Rosvi states in, in the southwest of this area um, and uh, Manyika and various um, African state structures that the Portuguese came into contact with. So these are the areas that I'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk, particularly um, Mozambique and the southeast of the uh, continent. Now, in terms of the, the kinds of documentary records that we have available of um, drought during the ice age and um, or, or rainfall more generally, um, these come from a wide range of colonial observers, um, missionaries, colonial officials, traveler diarists, traders, chroniclers, um, so on and so forth, um, who, as, as I hinted at earlier, described weather and climate when it mattered, um, often when it uh, only mattered to the, to the colonial presence, but but as this uh, small colonial presence was so entangled with with the um, the, the histories of, of um, Africans as well, uh, for example, dependence on on food uh, supplies and so on. Generally, the the, the recording of of um, uh, droughts that actually pose some kind of threat to or, or perceived opportunity to the, the colonial presence were recorded across that, that time frame that, that we're interested in here. The kind of accounts um, that exist are, are predominantly narrative accounts. So we don't really get um, very standardized sort of blow by blow daily accounts of, of weather. Um, although the bottom right figure, uh, the bottom right image, um, which is an extract from a, a Dutch uh, diary is, is an exception to that. But generally they describe, um, they, they they say that there was a drought in the land of X in the year 1758, and they offer some kind of description of its impacts. Um, and, and the example in the top right um, shows, uh, well, describes a, a drought between uh, 1792 and 1796, and it discusses the, the, the famine that ensued, the fact that um, the entire pig race was wiped out in the Zambezi, um, and uh, it had to be reestablished again via imports uh, from the coast. 
And part of some recent work that I've been involved in has been uh, compiling and um, categorizing references to uh, drought and also to wetter periods within those documentary records, which, as I said, were continuous from the 16th century uh, onwards, um, and examining what they say about Little Ice Age climate variability, but also seeing how they compare to those paleoclimate records that I spoke about um, in, in the early part of this talk. And what I've managed to do with a, a colleague of mine who um, can plot far prettier graphs than, than I can, um, is, is um, develop a kind of chronology of uh, wet and dry years in those two regions. Um, in, in our own work that relates to Mozambique and for Angola, uh, Southwest, uh, West Central Africa, that relates to earlier work done by um, the American historian, Joseph Miller. Um, but we, we've managed to um, assemble these chronologies and look for um, uh, long protracted droughts, which, which, what, which um, were what um, colonial observers, they, they predominantly felt and experienced drought um, rather than this, this longer term change that we often speak about when we talk about the Little Ice Age. Um, and that, that is almost without exception that there are very few, if any, records of um, uh, picking up on longer term changes in climates, We're almost without exception that they, they do refer to those extreme events um, that, that had impacts or, or uh, perceived impacts on, on society. Um, just a, a methodological point, because of that evidence that, that we're relying upon, because it's outsider evidence, if it's um, colonial evidence, uh, it comes with problems of uh, interpretation and, and um, unfamiliarity with, with environments, but also with its, with its um, quantity and its regularity. We did assess this by uh, confidence, so we added um, three being high confidence, where we have a number of records pointing to the same events, whereas one being low confidence, we, we um, use that where there are perhaps one or more scattered evidence of, of those events. But through doing this, um, through, through looking through uh, the, 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 the widest body of evidence that we could obtain, we found there were 68 uh, years classified, uh, classifiable for Mozambique and 87 for Angola. And they included nine multi-year uh, dry periods, that should say, uh, for Mozambique, four of which lasted for over three years. So um, some of these droughts lasted for six or even seven years, um, interspersed by only patchy rains. And in Angola, we found uh, 13 multi-year dry periods and uh, four again uh, of those very protracted drought events. Um, wetter years, are underrepresented in this. Um, they, they do feature there, but um, we, we think this is because uh, the, the, the impacts of wetter years were, were more sort of locally confined, for example, in the form of floods affecting colonial settlements. They may have not had a, a more uh, significant impact on uh, regional food production. So if there's a flood in one area, that could, uh, grain could perhaps be drawn from another area. Whereas if you get um, uh, widespread drought conditions, that becomes a lot more difficult. And also perhaps an, an underspoken uh, or an underappreciated factor in, in African history is, is the association of these droughts with, with uh, locust outbreaks, which often compounded the effects on, on agricultural systems. And um, really, uh, when, when locusts accompanied droughts, um, we often saw um, uh, subsistence crises and also potentially uh, warfare um, as well. It's important to say as well, um, with my academic hat on, I guess, um, is that uh, there does not appear to be a, um, a linear association between um, the increase in, in documentary recording that happened over this time frame and the, the reporting of, of climatic related uh, phenomena. So what we see in these graphs, for example, in Mozambique, we see that um, in, in the 16th century, there are actually more references to, to climate of, of any uh, or, or rainfall of any kind than in the 17th century, when actually the Portuguese presence was more uh, widespread, there were more records produced and it was more established. 
So actually, this does give a degree of confidence that these records do say something about um, or can give us an idea of, of a long term chronology. So the, re the real key point from this slide, I guess, and this work as a whole is that um, uh, longer term changes were, were not really a feature of the historical record. That's not to say that perhaps they weren't uh, experienced, but they, they weren't written about. And it was in fact these, these multi-year protracted droughts that you see in these kind of clusters of events here, 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 and here that really uh, made themselves felt upon um, human livelihoods and um, related factors. So without dwelling too much on, on this point, uh, we did look at how these um, uh, uh, records matched up with uh, paleoclimate records. And you may remember earlier that I, I said that in, in Angola, the, the Little Ice Age was, was uh, a period of wetter climate variability. You see that in this graph um, here. Uh, so this, this kind of wetter period that, that took root during the Little Ice Age main phase. Actually, that was marked by quite significant um, uh, variability within that period. And there were, there were a number of multi-year droughts that did occur within that wetter period as a whole. So this is one of the things that historical records can really add to those lower resolution paleoclimate records. And actually some of those wet period, those, those drier inter interludes do correspond with some tentative signs of drying in those climate records. In Mozambique, the picture is, is far more variable. We do get some matching up between the two different record types, but actually there's some unexplained and inconsistent patterns as well. For example, we see a, a drier period in the paleoclimate records during that Little Ice Age main phase, but actually we don't really get that many droughts reported. And the, there, are, there are perhaps a number of reasons for that, um, and I'll get onto some of those um, in, a, in, a, in a few slides time. Um, one other important factor here is that it's not just about wet or dry, but actually it's about the, the kind of changes that are going on and, and the rapidity of those changes. So one of the interesting things we found from this is that wetter periods, um, particularly these kind of transitions from a wetter to a drier period or a drier to a wetter period, show increased recording of both wet and dry events. So it's not just about baseline climatic conditions, but actually it's about this variability in the transition of one state to another that can uh, make itself felt at least within the documentary records that we uh, have here. And that's, again, something that I'll come back to towards the end of the presentation. So to move on to the final segment of um, the talk, and I hope we're doing OK for time still, um, but th this really um, okay. is great. Um, th this is really probably the, what, what's been the main focus of my research, which is looking at how people uh, responded to, adapted to, um, and uh, how climate variability impacted upon um, uh, different people groups, different uh, settlements and, and so on within um, Southeastern Africa in particular. And, and how does that relate to the Little Ice Age? Just to take a brief um, uh, um, tour of the African historiography uh, relating to um, environments and droughts. On the one hand, you have this, this older school of thought that, that argued that drought was, was very much central to this understanding of, of uh, history before, before um, uh, colonial times. And, and um, this, this was in fact the basic weakness that underlay the economy. There was no reliable defense against famine. Once you got those multi-year drought periods, there was, there was nothing that societies could do to, to avoid um, negative effects. On the other hand, you have a, a, a different school of thought that um, uh, takes issue with, with perhaps how, um, how African agency and, and um, uh, adaptation and adaptive capacity is underplayed um, and how African societies uh, buffered the impacts of drought by, by various forms of responses. What much of this literature does is it, is it falls into the trap of treating African societies as a, as a rather static block um, that um, all, had, all shared very common uh, characteristics in responding to, to these droughts. And there's equally further criticisms that the, that the kind of chronology is, is absent here as well. So 
often these kind of earlier inferences are based upon what we know from, from evidence from the late 19th century, actually when the colonial presence was, was already, uh, it, uh, it was the early stages of the scramble for Africa um, and, and colonial settlement was, was expanding rapidly. So there are hypotheses, but there are also problems in how they've been addressed in the past. And one of the things that I did during my PhD is to do a comparative study of a, um, a stretch of the Zambezi Valley, which is one of uh, Southern Africa's major rivers, um, which was inhabited um, and still is by, by Tonga speaking people, um, but actually came increasingly under uh, Portuguese colonialism from the late 16th century onwards. And the Mutapa state, as I mentioned earlier, which occupies a central place on many of the uh, Southern African maps uh, that, that we see from the 16th century onwards. Um, often it was called the Matapa Empire or the Monomatapa Empire. It was believed to have uh, jurisdiction over, over large parts of the region, um, which is um, something of an exaggeration, but it, it still was a, a very important uh, African state structure where many of the, the gold deposits that the Portuguese were, were interested in exploiting. Uh, were found. And what I found actually was that in response to two of those multi-year dry periods that I've spoken about, there were quite divergent responses to, um, to, to, the, to those drought periods. So in the Zambezi Valley, um, there, were, there was generally high mortality. Uh, some uh, communities exchanged or uh, family members for grain or, or even sold themselves into slavery. Um, or slavery of a different kind to, to what we saw in West Africa, but, but uh, nonetheless um, uh, subordinate positions in uh, colonial society. Um, and some uh, societies migrated. Whereas in the Mutapa state, it was only when uh, harvest shortfalls combined with, with processes like conflict that we actually started to see diff uh, these kind of deeper social impacts that, that cut into the political fabric of the region. Mortality, yes, but also things like political instability. And again, a similar pattern was observed in the 1820s when the situation in the Zambezi Valley was actually very different. Um, Portuguese estates and plantations had replaced or, or um, usurped and, and taken over many of the lands that were inhabited by the, the Tonga speaking people in the centuries gone by. Um, but we still observed this high mortality, there was still migration, and in fact there was, there was an even more almost uh, collapse-like uh, process in the breakdown of those Portuguese estates and plantations. Yet again in, in the Mutapa state, which again had a very different outlook um, by, the eight, by the 19th century, we did not have that breakdown of society. In fact, the story was one of resilience despite the state actually occupying um, a very similar environment to uh, the, the Portuguese in the Zambezi Valley. So one of the things I was interested in is, is what explains that kind of disparity, what kind of factors get to the root of, of that vulnerability to those uh, droughts that took place during the Little Ice Age. What I did to analyze this was, was uh, look at a, a wide range of factors um, to uh, hopefully attempt a kind of systematic uh, comparative assessment of uh, vulnerability, which was derived from the um, African historical literature, from archaeological literature, and from some of the modern day uh, climate change uh, uh, adaptation and vulnerability literature, which encompasses things like agroecosystems, so the diversity of crops cultivated which can uh, increase or decrease exposure to, to drought. <clears throat> Things like uh, alternative livelihood options, which could be exchanged for grain um, in times of, of drought. Things like mining and hunting. Also on the institutional angle, uh, things like uh, the redistribution of grain, grain storage, centralized grain storage and granaries, um, the presence of conflict and so on and so forth. So really trying to be as encompassing as possible in analyzing uh, vulnerability. And um, going beyond that, um, uh, we, uh, with, with some colleagues of mine, we we're actually assembling a, a database of African foodstuffs and <clears throat> food production and agricultural systems in the region, which, we, which we've uh, assembled from 
those written records and from archaeological records. So we, we have gone uh, very deep into the, um, into the archives and into the uh, archaeological records in order to try and do this kind of analysis. Um, and we've, we've plotted all these on, on Google Earth, turned them into uh, spatial data and um, got a, a database which is quite well um, uh, chronologically constrained as well. <clears throat> so just to explain those patterns, and, and this will be um, the last few slides of, of the talk. Um, what we what I found in, in this analysis, this, this vulnerability assessment in the, the sort of period before those droughts hit, is that um, in the Zambezi Valley, there were, there were a more limited range of crops cultivated and fewer domestic animals than in the Mutaka state, which had a more drought resistant crop mix and had abundant uh, cattle and uh, goats as well. Um, and the, the, the territorial uh, reach for, for things like hunting grounds were, were also quite wildly different. Again, in the Zambezi Valley at this time, uh, livelihood options were, were quite dependent on uh, cloth manufacturers. Um, <coughs> um, and uh, there was a localized trade in foodstuffs and cloth. But this, the, these options were, were was significantly lower and more limited than in the Mutapa state where we had a wider range of alternative livelihoods that could be intensified and uh, exchanged in, in, in times of stress um, for, for, for grain and uh, livestock with neighboring regions that perhaps weren't so drought affected. Equally in the Zambezi Valley, grain storage took place on the household level, whereas in the Mutapa state, we had household grain storage and a more centralized system of, of grain storage, which was often redistributed to um, different communities and villages in times of uh, stress. The Zambezi, of course, as well, was uh, more proximate to the expanding Portuguese, set Portuguese settlements, which had access to grain imports from, from uh, all across the Indian Ocean, basically. Um, and it was um, only really in, in times of conflict that this drought in the Metapa state actually started to have uh, more significant impacts. So we might therefore attribute those, those differential impacts of uh, drought in that period to, to a very um, sort of wholesale difference in, in factors that um, determine vulnerability. Not every factor, because um, we, we, we can't measure every factor or, or analyze every factor in, in colonial records, but at least those ones that we do have um, evidence on. In the intervening period, actually, this drought did have significant impacts. It accelerated processes that were already underway. So across the 17th century, we had a growth of uh, Portuguese uh, colonial uh, expansion in the region. We had a growth of uh, plantations on, on the Zambezi or, or Prazos uh, estates. And actually, one of the factors that, that did come with that was the introduction of crops like uh, winter wheat and uh, maize, which did, uh, to some extent, uh, have um, effects to uh, diversify the crop system, uh, the agricultural systems, and perhaps reduced um, immediate sensitivity to uh, drought. Maybe that is one of the reasons that, that we have less uh, records or, or, or um, yeah, records of, of drought in the 17th century. Um, but in the Matapa state, actually, the, the drought um, and the, the, the call of the Matapa ruler on the Portuguese for, for aid um, to deal with the conflicts, um, uh, to deal with invasions from, from north of the Zambezi, actually led to significant uh, concessions and coercion um, uh, from the Portuguese and eventually um, in the 1630s, the state was, was uh, conquered with the confiscation of gold mines and also moves towards forced labor in the, the state itself. Um, there, were, there was also uh, smallpox epidemics and, um, and uh, 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 eventually there was a relocation of the uh, Mutaka state to the Zambezi Valley um, outside of that area that was under significant stress. With that migration to the, the Zambezi, however, um, bearing in mind the, the environment that we, we're talking about here, 
and the, the tsetse fly, which makes um, cattle keeping very difficult in certain parts of the region, um, the Matapa state lost its, its cattle, which were actually the uh, significant, um, uh, formed a significant part of uh, Matapa livelihoods and also a source of uh, bride wealth. And this really led to a, a significant change in the, the, the sort of modus operandi of the state in, in comparison to its previous um, years and centuries, in that uh, greater numbers of, of, of uh, people were forced to sort of serve rulers um, as soldiers, hunters, and traders in return for wives, instead of um, uh, uh, using cattle that could have been uh, a significant source of bride wealth in previous uh, centuries. So actually we had a transformation of the, the structure of the state um, throughout that intervening period. But actually that didn't uh, make the state vulnerable to uh, drought. Actually, we can see that again, as I was talking about earlier, as kind of an adaptive transformation in response to the stresses that, it, that the state was faced with Yes, in the form of drought through, through these uh, little ice age related uh, protracted droughts, but also in response to the threats it was faced by uh, from the Portuguese. Increasingly, um, that also related to the slave trade in the early 19th century, as uh, Mozambique became the sort of epicenter of the uh, Atlantic slave trade. So despite a loss of uh, material wealth, in, in the Matapa state, despite a, a relocation to the Zambezi Valley, despite losing its cattle and losing its, its gold fields, we didn't actually see that breakdown of society that we got in the Zambezi Valley in, that, in, in the, the very long and protracted drought that took root in the 1720s. And even despite what I mentioned on the previous slide, that the crop diversification that took place in the Zambezi Valley, with the, uh, the introduction of wheat and maize, and even the buildup of livestock, the access of uh, the uh, estates to grain imports from, from Mozambique, from Madagascar, from uh, Mauritius as well. Actually, we, we did see uh, more significant effects of that drought in the Zambezi Valley and in the colonial settlements. And really, there are, there are some factors that, that really explain that, that, that took root in, in earlier periods um, rather than in the immediate uh, foreground of, of this drought event. And those that I highlight here are the growth of the slave trade um, and the related um, enslavement and uh, sale of free Africans that actually provided the, African, the, the uh, agricultural labor on the, the Portuguese estates. So there was a drive towards short-term gain at the expense of uh, long-term stability, um, often by absentee uh, landholders. Whereas in the Matapa state, actually that, uh, that reorganization of the state that I spoke about in the previous slide, um, turned the state into a more sort of militaristic uh, unit that could stave off the threats of hunger, but also the threat of the slave trade and uh, Portuguese expansion. And despite that Portuguese pen penetration of the state in the previous century, what we actually saw was a resilience in the agrarian institutions and food relief systems of the state itself. So whilst we may get these, these kind of grand tales of how the Portuguese conquered the state, how it uh, diminished in complexity, how it lost its cattle and, and gold wealth, actually what we saw was, was a maintenance and a resilience of those agrarian institutions and food relief systems. And in concluding, I'd like to just uh, pull up a quote by uh, the historian Malin Newitt, who um, rather nicely uh, draws in, in, in a kind of cross-Atlantic comparison here with uh, the Spanish in, in South America. And he argues that had there been a great empire of uh, Mutapa, then a ruthless Portuguese conquistador might have acted on the part of uh, Pizarro and overthrown the monarch and seized control of the country but actually the small scale segmentary nature of um, African political organization proved far more resilient than the great military monarchies of South America, which I think nicely uh, draws into, um, into focus the, the importance of social context in interpreting 
the impacts of uh, climate variability um, instead of simply looking for coincidence and looking at sort of headline, often uh, quantitative um, uh, effects or, or processes or uh, material wealth in understanding how these processes uh, play out and interact. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just skip over this, but, but this is just an example of, of the kinds of impacts that, that took place on the, on the Portuguese settlements and the, uh, the Zambezi Valley in the 1820s. Uh, so many reports of famine that I had to um, just sift out some of the, the best ones here. Um, but uh, basically the, the famine uh, in turn, um, uh, the, the lack of rain um, led uh, in part to, to migration. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the selling of, of um, um, agricultural labor into the slave trade meant that even if there was sufficient rain, as is spoken about in the third quote, there were no hands to do the cultivating since all the, since all the slaves were scattered throughout various lands. And um, very much an, attribut an attribution of the uh, state of the, the colonial settlements to the famine, um, but of course not really picking up on those uh, reasons, that, those deeper rooted reasons for why that um, unfolded. I haven't spoken much about uh, West Central Africa here, but I just want to, um, uh, before moving on to the, the last slide, um, just speak, just, just re-emphasize the importance of what I spoke about with, with that, um, uh, that, when I noted variability, the importance of variability and the importance of these transitions that, that we're talking about. The events that, I, that I've spoken about in, in Mozambique were at these times of transition from, from wet to dry and dry to wet when we have increased variability. This um, was a process that also unfolded in West Central Africa. Um, a quote here from uh, the governor of Luanda, uh, Vasconcelos, in 1799, uh, indeed quite uh, presciently picked up on that variability when he noted that we who live in this land are faced constantly with the choice between dying of hunger in the dry years or of sickness in the rainy ones. In such a place, what could prosper or who would want to live? And in fact, uh, Vasconcelos here was talking about a, um, an increased prevalence of uh, what are known as late rains in Angola. And in times of, um, uh, well, in, in the time of variability that we're talking about here, at the end of the little ice age, as we came out of uh, what in Angola was a, a, was a wetter period into a drier period, we have increased events of uh, very heavy late rains in, in, in April and May. And in fact, in the last year, um, well, this year, in fact, there was a similar event um, of, of very heavy rains in, in a, in a semi-arid region, which caused flash flooding and um, led to displacement and even uh, 24 uh, deaths as well. So these kind of processes that, that um, happen in times of transition are happening uh, now and still having very significant and severe effects on society today. So to wrap up, uh, sorry I've been a bit long, um, just to finish and, and go back to those um, key messages that I began by, uh, or key questions that I began by posing, <clears throat> in answer to the first one of was there a little ice age in Africa and what did it look like? Well, yes, there was. We see a very clear imp imprint of that in temperature records but more significantly for societies in uh, records of past moisture availability. But that was not unanimously dry or wet within uh, a certain region or even uh, with, uh, between those regions as well. <clears throat> and over time, there were, there were differences within and between those areas. Number two, how was the Little Ice Age experienced and perceived? Well, I've problematized those simple rise and fall narratives that you get by only looking at a, a narrow portion of the data. And I've related that to some of the, pro some of the issues that, that Dagomar perhaps raised earlier in the week. And, and to add to that, um, I, I would add that it, it is extremely difficult to actually understand how historical observers perceived those longer term changes. The prevalence of extreme events instead was what was captured by, at least in this part of the world, by um, colonial observers. 
especially those multi-year droughts that lasted over three years in length, which, which did have significant but uh, varying effects across the region. And that's what I spoke about in the, in the third part of this talk, when I uh, demonstrated how Little Ice Age climate variability and its impacts were very much contingent upon vulnerability of societies and uh, the differences in those vulnerabilities that relate to a wide range of factors. And they varied over time as well as across and between societies. But also the fact that um, climate was not everything. These uh, adaptations and, and changes took place amongst a much larger social context um, and maybe framed in the light of multiple exposures, um, not least of all colonialism and uh, expanding merchant capital, as well as uh, uh, droughts and other factors as well. But what we've, what we've seen, particularly through looking at the Mutapa state, is a story of resilience, as well as one of vulnerability. And in demonstrating that, I've spoken about how, yes, material factors like crop diversity may have mattered, may have reduced exposure and sensitivity to those droughts, but actually it was very much the institutional factors that were um, most important. Things like um, uh, grain redistribution, things like um, um, uh, the, uh, the governance of uh, the estates uh, and the, um, the, the goals of the social actors behind those estates. Was this short-term gain? Was this long-term sustainability? Um, and so on and so forth. So the importance of social context in interpreting these processes cannot be understated. And I'd like to leave it there. Um, but finally, I'd just like to give a plug for this um, new book, which I've written with some colleagues in Utrecht, which is open access, it's freely available, and it explores some of those um, elements about institutional um, formations, which I, I've sort of spoken about in the latter part of this talk. So thank you very much for the attention. Great. I'm sorry I've kind of dropped off with the chat a bit, but I'm happy to take <laughs> um, uh, questions. That's okay. Thank you. And thank you so much for the book reference. I made a note of it and I'll include it here.